thank you so much for joining us today for this donor box webinar my name is jenna and i am the non advocate for donor box oh, no. and i'll also be the moderator oh i hear you aaron but i don't see you all right sorry about that guys so for those of you who are not familiar with donor box we provide nonprofits with simple and effective tools to manage their online fundraising activities and connect with individual donors on a deeper level to date we have helped over 50,000 organizations raise over 900 million dollars we just updated those numbers to learn more you can visit our site at donorbox.org and today we are joined by Erin McClarty to talk about compliance and the five things you need to know to keep your nonprofit running. This is very important. Now, Erin started her career as a counsel for International Fortune rated companies. Now she lives out her passion as the principal of EMP LLC, providing strategy business consulting and legal services to mission focused organizations. Her clients range from startup businesses, nonprofits, social enterprises and foundations to community centers, public private partnerships, government institutions and individual leaders. Essentially anyone or thing wanting to create, grow or manage their positive impact. Erin also writes a blog on legal issues for mission-related organizations and is working on a how-to book for charities. And you're back, Erin. Awesome. Uh, we are so excited to have her today. Now, before I pass the baton over to Erin, I want to mention just a couple of items. Please note that Erin's presentation will be about 40, 45 minutes long with an additional 10 minutes allotted at the end for Q&A. This webinar is being recorded. We have you covered and we will uh, email you that link after the webinar. So hang in there with us and we'll get it to you by tomorrow. We'll also be providing any of those awesome links and resources that you may hear of during this presentation. Now you'll notice in the right hand corner of your screen that you've got a chat box. I think most of you have found it. Please utilize this throughout the presentation to drop your questions so that I can be behind the scenes marking those and we can answer as many as we can. You'll also see a couple of helpful links pop up throughout this presentation and those will be in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. You can open those and they will open right up. Okay, Erin. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass the baton over to you. Everybody, please give Erin a warm welcome. We're so excited to have you today. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I hear good. other people. You sound good. Uh, okay, good. I see other people are having trouble. My internet is not playing very well, apparently with Demio, but we're gonna roll with it. If I log off, I'll log right back on. So uh, you'll fill questions and we'll figure it all out. But Thank you, Jenna, for the introduction. Um, let's see, I won't spend too much time on talking about myself since I already had that illustrious introduction from, from Jenna. Thank you so much, everybody, for being so welcoming. Um, many places that I, I would love to be at right now uh, and hopefully will be when outside opens. But I am a social impact architect here in Houston and an attorney by training. I work with people who have visions of the impact that they wanna have and the work that they wanna do. And I help them connect the dots, uh, basically architect, create the blueprint for translating that vision into reality. And a lot of this process requires that we look at compliance to make sure that the work that we've done to put their initiatives and their programs and their visions together, don't get squandered away by um, reputational damage or issues that come up with various governments. So I'm super excited to see such a breadth of organizations here. Um, and we'll make a few caveats. One, I am licensed in Texas. I have worked internationally and I do work with clients internationally. So I've got folks uh, actually in Kenya, Tasmania, um, throughout Mexico and in various other places. So I keep up, but I'm not licensed there. So I won't know all the nuances, but I'm happy to answer questions and to the extent that I don't know an answer to find someone who does. 
Um, to that extent, I also don't know where all of you are on your compliance journey. Some of you may be uh, a little further ahead than others. And so what I may talk about today, you, you could be a rock star and have it all covered. In that case, please do be thinking about questions that you have had that you wish that you could ask or that you'd like to leverage the brain trust for and ask those. Uh, so this is not to say that this presentation as I've put it together has to be the end all be all, but it's just the top issues that I see when working with organizations. Last, take care with the hypotheticals. So if you wouldn't want some type of government agency to hear the question that you asked, maybe don't ask that question in public. <laughs> I've had people ask some hypotheticals that, yeah, probably shouldn't have been asked. So just if it's something that's very touchy, if it's a hypothetical that's not so hypothetical that uh, could possibly lead to some problems, do feel free to reach out through Jenna and the group to me directly, and we'll try to get you hooked up with someone that can, that can help. And that's just kind of the agendas. I'm gonna walk through the first five items. I took this very loosely when I decided what these items were going to be, so just roll with me. I'll share some resources and then we'll close out by asking questions. And like I said, um, internet has been spotty, so if I blink out, it seems like it reconnects me. So just gather your questions, um, hold your bated breath, and I will be back and we'll keep, we'll keep rolling with it. Also, if you can't hear, because I hear some people, I see some people say they can't hear, um, this will be recorded. So if there's portions that you may miss, um, you'll have the recording as well. So first thing that uh, people often miss in their compliance journey or don't think about is fundraising and making sure that they follow fundraising requirements. So here I bring this up because there are moments where you need to be thinking about when I send out solicitations, when people donate to me, are there bigger requirements that I have around reporting those donations and those requirements? Uh, depending on where you're at, I saw there's a lot of different countries here, it can range. Specifically in the US, each state actually has its own fundraising law. Uh, some states like Texas don't really have much around fundraising. They usually stick to things around specific issues like veteran, military, police. Other states like California, uh, New York have a tremendous amount of fundraising laws. So when you are sending out solicitations and or when you are accepting donations, this is something you have to be thinking about because you do have certain states that are cracking down on this as a way of generating revenue. You also have countries that are cracking down on this as a way of generating, generating revenue. And just to make sure that they don't have issues come up like they've done like uh, Miami, in Florida, they've really been cracking down because of all the fake cancer organizations that have been fundraising and, and it just becomes a huge issue when you have that happen and so they're getting very preemptive. And so when you are accepting donations, track where you're getting those donations from. Uh, some people will see, oh, I'm getting a lot of donations from California. I may need to make sure that I'm registered because the way some states define fundraising does not necessarily mean you have to be as active as some people think they have to be. Um, fundraising is defined differently in different jurisdictions. And so track where you're receiving funds from. Um, also be thinking about when you get listservs and email lists and you send out appeals. I may not be reaching out to people in California initially, but someone may sign up for my list from California and I may send them an end of year campaign immediately now that's a solicitation. So it's a pretty fluid concept and it's something to, be, something to be thinking about. One way to navigate some of the fundraising challenges is to file what's called a unified registration statement here in the US. There are similar concepts in other jurisdictions, so you might just wanna check in the country, province, geographic locale that you're in. Uh, but the unified registration statement, what it does is it allows you to register using one form in 35 plus different states. Um, it makes it a little bit easier to make sure that you're on the right side of registration. I'll talk about nuances with that in a second, but it does ease the load quite a bit. Um, and for those who are not on the unified registration statement, you'll just want to work with someone in states uh, that don't to see what your fundraising obligations may, may be. But I wanna point that out because it's becoming more and more of an issue for organizations. 
Uh, they're getting nasty notes from the attorney generals and different government agencies within the states that they're in because they have either sent out solicitation or they're taking friends from someone of that state and they're not registered to do so before before taking the funds. Let's see, I clicked. Oh. Okay. I think that's it. So as far as the nuances of the unified registration statement, uh, something to keep in mind is that each state that accepts the unified registration statement, uh, they may have specific requirements in terms of attachments that you have to have to that statement, how often you file. Some have a yearly requirement. Some may only have a first time only requirement. Some may require that you have bonding and insurance for any fundraisers that you may be working with in that state. So it doesn't get you out the, the, the hot box of making sure that you're actually checking in with states to see what their fundraising requirements are, but it does make it a little bit easier that you have one document that you have to be, um, that you have to file, though it may have attachments that you have to file as well. And you can find that if you Google unified registration statement, there's a website for it and it goes through some of the other nuances that come up with it. So that's one way to, to, to get started with that. Um, what else did I have here? Yeah. So make sure that if you, if you do have to file annually, is that through the statement? Is it through some other filing? It can get a little complex. So there are people who do this for a living, uh, who just focus on helping organizations comply with uh, their fundraising requirements. If you say I say it, I will deny it. But there is a spectrum of risk, right? If you're an organization that only fundraises, not only, but fundraises $1,000 in a specific state, the risk may not and probably won't be as high as if you're fundraising a million dollars. So that's why I recommend to organizations be tracking who you receive funds from and where they're coming from. Because if you see there's a certain trend in your top five, then you'll wanna make certain that at least in the top five, where, where your biggest risks are possibly, uh, that you are complying with whatever those registration requirements might be. And then if you're getting one-off spot donations that are large amounts, in other places, then you might want to just check with their legislation. Usually it's in their codes uh, that will talk about talk about uh, fundraising requirements. But you can also check with their offices that monitor nonprofits because they'll have materials on fundraising as well because it's become such an issue. Speaking of yearly requirements, be making make sure that you are familiar with what jurisdictions you're in and what jurisdictional requirements you may have in those jurisdictions. So for example, in Texas, there's maybe one or two documents that I have to file every year. I can tell you that uh, one of the top mistakes that I see organizations make is they're not terribly familiar, nor do they understand what they should be filing on a yearly basis in the places where they are formed. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons why there's places like California, again, that have just several different requirements. And so people just aren't aware. There's an information statement. There's updates you have to make. There's your charitable registration statement. And so there, there's typically an office over nonprofits or that governs nonprofits that you can reach out to that will at least let you know for their office and anyone that touches their office what those obligations might be. Uh, but figure, figure that out and make sure that, you, that you're actually asking. Um, because if you don't, oftentimes, these states and their agencies have the ability to dissolve your organization involuntarily is what it's called. So I have seen many organizations come to me that didn't file when they needed to file, only found out after the fact when their organization had been dissolved. You usually can reinstate it, but what it means is technically your organization for that period does not exist. So you wanna make sure that you're familiar with what your, your, your requirements might be. What could those requirements be? Again, it might be registering with the charities office or the office that oversees charities. It may be an audit requirement. I know in Massachusetts, if you make over a certain amount uh, every year, then you have to file an, an audit with the office. It may be those fundraising requirements I was just talking about. It may be an information statement. Many states, just to make sure that they have an updated database, will have an information statement that they'll require that people be submitting. Um, it may be a, a statement around your board. 
It could be a statement around donations. So just make sure that you reach out to those offices and that you're getting familiar with that. And when I say those offices, not just the office of where you're headquartered, but sometimes if you have what's called a foreign registration filing. So let's say you are one of these Moroccan entities and you do a significant amount of business in Texas, so much so that you did a foreign registration filing in Texas, then you'll need to make sure that in addition to whatever um, requirements, yearly requirements you have where you're at in Morocco, that you're also complying with the Texas requirements. So anywhere where you have principal offices, headquarters, places of significant business, you want to make sure that you're familiar with what those requirements might be. Um, also, you'll want to make sure that there aren't any permits that you need to have. Business permits, sales permits, uh, permits around food, distributions, fundraising permits. All of that is stuff that you'll want to make sure that you familiarize yourself with. If you are a 501c3 in the U.S., then you'll also have yearly requirements with the IRS. Your 990 filing, for example, and there's eight of those. Uh, what should you be filing? Are there attachments? Should you be or did you agree to monitor your lobbying expenses? Is there unrelated business income that's come in? And I'm going to talk about what that is in a second that you need to be reporting. And so being familiar with what your IRS filing requirements are is important as well. If you don't file for three consecutive years, then they strip you of your 501c3 status. You've probably heard of a lot of organizations in the last few years. I think there were thousands that had, no, maybe hundreds, if I remember correctly, that had their 501c3 status stripped because they hadn't filed any reports in the last three years. And with one of the recent legislation acts that was passed, that became a requirement. So make sure that you're familiar with what your IRS filings are, that you actually are filing those because they will absolutely dissolve you if you don't. Um, and then again, make sure that you're, you're aware of what yearly filings you need to do in terms of the registrations that you've done, um, whether it be federal, state, provincial, et cetera. Check the chats to make sure that I'm thousand plus. I thought it might be a thousand. I didn't want to be hyperbolic, but I, I know a lot of people lost their 501c3 status in the US. And a lot of them that lost their 501c3 status were organizations from other countries who hadn't been keeping up with compliance. So I had a lot of people that were calling me from various parts throughout Africa, throughout Europe, that had had their 501c3 status in the US to help them with fundraising and to make sure that they got that charitable deduction, but didn't keep up with their filing reports. Um, and as a result, had it had it uh, stripped. You can get it back. So there is a whole process of getting your, your, your status reinstated. Uh, there is the possibility that you may have to pay fees. Oftentimes, if there are specific reasons or, or, or excuses I don't want to say excuses, but excuses for why you didn't file, then they may waive those fees. A lot of the organizations that I've worked with have had have been able to have those fees waived. But be thinking about what do I need to be filing on a yearly basis? I tell clients to put that in a calendar. So have your calendar ahead of time that says, oh, you know, by March 15th, I probably need to have this file by this time. By May, I need to have this information report filed with the state and have those things pop up because I know that when you're in the middle of doing the work um, that we can forget to do those things. Other common mistakes is kind of a side tangent, but I thought it was really important uh, because all these mistakes I see either lead to people losing their entity as a result, so they get dissolved, or they lose their 501c3 status. Make sure you update your registered agents. Registered agents, when you filed your organization, are fundamentally the way that they're going to get in contact with you. It's their way of saying, we sent you this letter. We're assuming if we sent this letter to who you told us to send this letter to, that you've received this letter. So if there's some type of time deadline in that letter and you have to respond by you know, 15 days and you haven't, Saying we didn't get it or that was an old board member, we don't, you know, they, they didn't tell us they received it is not going to cut it. So make sure every year that your registered agent um, is updated. That's the other reason why these public information reports are important, because usually that will remind you or, or will allow you to state this is who you should be sealing, sending our, our mail to. Um, so make sure you have those contacts updated. If you have a board member roll off, if you have significant board changes, if you have significant staff changes, your ED leaves, just make sure that that registered agent is updated because again, if you get mail saying that we didn't get it, it's not gonna cut it if they send it to your registered agent. Also, make sure that you, go, you update your governance documents. 
Think about the last time you looked at your certificate of formation. You know, think about the last time you looked at your bylaws. When's the last time that you updated those? I've had clients come in that hadn't updated their governance document. So they're, for example, their articles of incorporation for 75 years. You probably need to update your articles after 75 years. So be thinking about that. And when I say update, there may be a mission statement that's shifted. Uh, there may be scope changes. You may have widened, you may have restricted your scope. This is important because ultimately, legally, you are held responsible to what you have in your formation document. So you being formed 100 years ago is not an excuse for you not complying with your formation documents. Um, I'm trying to think of situations that I've had come up. So usually it's mission statement. I've had a lot of clients that will come up with a snazzy mission statement after amount of time, but that mission statement, when I pull up their certificate or the articles, it doesn't match. You aren't legally obliged to the new one, you're obliged to the old one. And so let's say a board member complains, let's say the attorney general for whatever reason is asking you questions and they ask about your mission and some activities related to your mission, you're gonna be responsible to, responsible for what's in that formation document, not for what you have in your brand new schnazzy marketing. So make sure that you've updated those things as well. Uh, same thing with your bylaws. I've met a lot of people whose bylaws have not been updated. And that's a problem because ultimately decisions that you make and the reasons you make them will be held up against what's in your bylaws. So if you're not complying with your bylaws because they're just not updated, that's gonna be a mark against you and it's probably gonna lead to some bigger bigger issues. So if you haven't looked at your governance documents, do that. Don't put policies in place that you don't read. Conflicts of interest, whistleblower, um, compensation. It's important to have these policies and I, I tell clients to put them in place and I help them put them in place. But if you never read it again and you don't follow it, you're creating more problems for yourself than you would have had not having had the policy. So if you have policies, make sure that they're in a binder um, that's read in your you know, employment documents, but don't have policies in place that you don't actually follow or don't even know what they what they say. Uh, make sure that when you are uh, meeting, that you're meeting regularly. I have a lot of clients that say, oh, well, we meet once a year. Once a year may meet your legal requirements because typically in most states you have to meet annually. Now that's in the US, it could shift in other countries as, as a um, reminder. I know through various parts of Canada, there's actually more restrictive requirements that do require more meeting, but once a year is not enough to keep abreast of what's going on in the organization. So if you're on the board, if you're a foundation working with organizations, asking and seeing, are you meeting at least quarterly to hear what's going on with the organization, updates, to be able to catch problems with the organization? That's what's gonna be what you're responsible for. And that's what they're gonna be thinking about when they talk about your fiduciary duties. Make sure that you're keeping books and records uh, just in general where they need to be. So most states require that you keep books and records in your principal place of business. An attorney general should be able to say, at this address, give me your books and records and you provide them. I have had cl past clients who in Texas were asked by the attorney general, hey, we've gotten this, um, not complaint, but someone raised this thing. We're, they sent the request to the address. Um, the address actually was like a faux address, so it was never received. And then when it was received, the books and records weren't there. And so the attorney general actually fined them. Make sure, you know, again, looking at your formation documents, whatever your principal place of business is that you say you're going to have your uh, books and records at that you actually do, one, actually have books and records. So your finances, right? Um, doesn't have to be a fancy audit, but just your statements, monthly statements, yearly statements. Uh, major expenses or contracts, but make sure that you have all of those things together. And then make sure that you're also keeping them in a place where they can be viewed publicly because most states uh, do have requirements that the books and records of a nonprofit at least be able to be, be viewed publicly uh, if requested. And then lastly, of course, make sure that you make your appropriate filings. Make sure. Uh, just making sure I'm responsive here. So I saw the thing. I am a fan of efficiency. As you can imagine, I have challenges with anything that rockets or zooms. 
So while Rocket Lawyer and some of the other tools are incredibly helpful for certain things, most of my clients, to be frank with you, came to me after they came to one of those. And, and let me tell you why. Many of those services will do what you tell them. If you don't know, you won't tell them and they won't do it. And so when it comes to templates and things that require that, that lend themselves to requirements, when it comes to being customized, that may not necessarily happen if you're rocketing and zooming. So, you know, being facetious, but just keep that in mind is that you, you, you're not necessarily going to get the individualization that you might need, especially if you're in a particularly uh, risky um, organization or organization that may have a lot of liability, working with vulnerable populations, for example, working with high net wealth and reputational damage may be a concern. So just keep those things in, in mind um, when you're working with them. National international privacy laws. This is a biggie. Uh, a law, each country, each city, each state, it seems like, has their own privacy law. So truly in, in, in the US, each state will have its own requirements around what type of information to collect, how it has to be collected, how it has to be secured, um, what happens if there is a breach. Something that's important, and I think I talk about this in the next slide, most of these laws are what they're called long arm statutes. It does not matter that I am not a California entity for Californian privacy law to apply. The law applies to the person and their information. So if I'm collecting information from someone fr from someone from California, I will be responsible to Californian privacy law. Same with Germany, same with France, same with a number of different places, is attaches to the person and to the information. And so this is another one of those situations where you want to make sure that you're monitoring where your contacts are coming from and then reach out to someone and say, hey, it looks like we're getting a lot of people from boom, 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 boom. Let's at least familiarize ourselves with those laws because we've got so many people that's coming, coming from them. Also, nonprofits are synonymous for asking for Social security number, zodiac sign, you know, hobbies and interests. They ask for a lot of information, many times that they don't need. And I get sometimes this is because of the funders that they work with. So this might be a conversation with funders to limit the amount and types of information that you're asking for from people so that you don't have such risk in terms of the information that you're collecting. But this is another one to be aware of is where is information coming from and what are my obligations with respect to that information? Uh, can spam in the US, you know, Canada has their privacy law that's actually kind of the opposite of can spam, right? So whereas in can spam uh, and in the US in general, I can throw out information to people and then they can opt out. Throughout Canada, you actually have to opt in first before someone contacts you or you can be fine. It's those nuances that you have to be familiar with. Also, no shade to the US, we're known as the worst in privacy law protections. So a lot of countries don't wanna fool with us <laughs> and have laws specifically because of how loose our privacy laws are. Enter GDPR. You probably got a lot of notices about that a year or two ago when that became a thing. It's still a thing. So making sure that if you are collecting information from anyone that could possibly, if you are making it accessible to people throughout Europe, you will want to be GDR compliant. And that has a whole host of other requirements around type of information collected. What happens if I request my information? There are right to be forgotten laws throughout Europe. So what happens if I tell you I want you to delete my information? I don't want you sharing my case study. I don't want to be a part of the website anymore. There, how long is it going to take for you to respond to me? What does that process look like? Um, what happens if there is a breach? Are you responsible for monitoring? What does the monitoring look like? GDPR requires training uh, and certifying to training. It's still very new and there's a lot of questions around what it looks like if you don't comply, but I would rather not find out. So making sure that you're familiar with those requirements is gonna be pretty important as well. Um, what else here? I mentioned it's a long arm statue, so it attaches to the person. Link to GDPR. So I actually, I'll be a part of the, the, the community that's going to be um, the donor box community. And so I'll share a link to the GDPR stuff in the, in the donor box. Uh, that's not a problem. Uh, let's see. Uh-oh. Okay. 
Um, and then again, if you have some type of breach, if people do get access to information that they shouldn't have access to, do you have a process for one, notifying people and two, for monitoring or making sure that there aren't any damages as a result of that? Many states do have a requirement that if you're collecting the information of their citizens, that um, there be a process in place if there's a breach and what the breach, what that looks like, how long it's going to last, et cetera. E-commerce. So thinking about, again, should I, do I have to have a seller's permit? If you're in Kentucky, you have to have a permit around selling certain things. And so depending on where you're selling to, is that going to be a requirement? Um, is there a business permit that I have to have if I'm selling things online and people are purchasing it? What does taxes look like? Most states now have a requirement that you do tax even if you are offering it online. Texas was a big one around that with the Wayfair case, I think it was. Um, and so are you collecting taxes? Are you remitting taxes to the appropriate states? Shopify and a lot of these e-commerce platforms do have a process in place that allows you to, that works with you to collect tax and then ultimately remit it. And so you may wanna work with a specific platform, but it's something to be thinking about. Um, if I am selling, is there paperwork that I have to file with the IRS? There's something called unrelated business income tax. There's, uh, or unrelated business income. And that's really stuff that's not related to the mission uh, that you're going to be taxed on. So a great example was a 501c3 that was a sanctuary for animals. They made uh, soap out of milk from the goats and cows on the farm. And then they had really cool information on the soap about uh, the sanctuary work that they were doing. They didn't think that that was not related to their mission because it came from the animals. It educated on the animals. It was a great way to engage with people who came to the farm and then they started selling it on e-commerce. The IRS found that it was unrelated business income tax. That has to be reported and you have to pay a tax on it. So if you're selling and you have an e-commerce site, making sure that you're, you're filing that paperwork is important as well. Um, yeah, and are there any other filings that you have to make? The biggest thing with e-commerce that I would keep in mind, because I get this question a lot, how active do I have to be or what do I have to do to trigger these laws from the other states? It depends is unfortunately the answer. There's this, uh, the Georgia Convention is what it's called. And so it's a group of AGs that have come together to try to figure that out because the problem is substantial, words like substantial, words like active. They haven't been defined across places like the US. And so what active is in Texas is completely different than what active is in Minnesota. And naturally that can become overwhelming for people like you all. So there is a process of trying to get everyone together for them to define what these things mean. In the meanwhile though, it really is incumbent on you to research. And when I say research, it's going in, seeing where money is coming from, going to those state sites. They usually the agencies will have information for example, in Texas, the Texas comptroller has all this information on collecting tax. What happens if you're selling from outside the state? How do you get tax in? So making sure that you're familiarizing yourself with those things is really important. I will caveat that the risk, think about your risk profile. If you sell $100 worth of stuff, that risk profile is different than if you sell, I've had clients that had e-commerce sites, they were generating $250,000. And so Bearing in mind your risk, you may decide to go in different directions, but I wanted to make sure to bring up e-commerce because it is a great way to diversify your revenue and it's really important for organizations. And there's just some things that come with that that you'll wanna make sure that you're familiar with. As part of the e-commerce site that you'll wanna make sure you have your terms of use. Um, so more complicated, it is very complicated. And I hate that it's this complicated. It's not as complicated in other places like places throughout Europe that tend to focus on more unified standards in the US, it's just with the different states, it's kind of how it's worked out. Uh, but I'll talk about the overwhelm in a second. So terms of use, um, getting clear on your liability. So when we talk about how do we ease some of the complication and the worry, terms of use on your e-commerce sites are essential. Because I tell clients, this is the way that you fence in your risk. This is the way that you call the shots and set your terms for how you want this to go. To a certain extent now, you can't get crazy because ultimately the government has a say in that. But getting clear on the types of liability that you wanna be responsible for. Uh, what is it that you're most concerned about? Think about the customer journey of the people who are purchasing. What could go wrong? What could be problematic? What don't you wanna be responsible for? Then back in from that. So whereas you may see terms of use online that you like, 
use them as inspiration, but definitely don't copy and paste them. Look at what your specific journey is going to look like and then back in from that journey. So if you know shipping may be tricky because you're shipping ceramics that kids make um, and you make them available to people who want to purchase them, then make sure that you talk about shipping a little bit more than some of the standard terms may be talking about them. We won't be responsible for damage and, and route. We'll be responsible, we won't be responsible from the moment deposited at the US uh, Postal Office or whatever the case may. You can insure, we will insure for additional costs. All that should be in your terms, your terms of use. Uh, so insurance, um, if there's things that could result in extra damages, so really high risk items, you wanna talk about those in your terms of use. Um, warranties, the U.S. does have a very specific warranty. Uh, it, well, there's a national law around warranty and then there's warranty laws for each state. And so wanting to be familiar with those. And when I say warranty, what you promise. How is it gonna work? How long will it work? What will happen if it stops working? And what will you do if it stops working? Those are all things that you wanna make sure that you're, you're talking about. Um, again, making sure that you're GDR compliant in your terms, and then also making sure that you have all the other terms that are going to be important. So things like your privacy policy have to have a privacy policy for the reasons that we just talked about with collecting private information um, or personally identifying information is what it's called. Anything that can definitely mean name, address, email address, phone number, driver's license number, etc. Um, cookies policy, a lot of people are doing those now. So if you use cookies in most sites, especially if you use a site builder, a Weebly, a Wee, uh, I forget what it's called, but Squarespace, all of those will use cookies. And so most people will have some type of cookies policy now that talks about what you track, what you don't track, and what people can do if they don't want to be tracked, especially as people get leery. If you share content, songs, videos, pictures, then you might also want to post a copyrights policy. So what happens if I go on your website and I see that you have a picture that looks vaguely familiar to what I've created? How do I get in contact with you? How do I get it taken down? What does that process end up looking like, et cetera? And then one thing I wanted to jump, the, kind of throw in is private annealment, which is a big thing in the US. Anytime you have charity assets that are going to an individual or very limited use, you need to be thinking about private annealment. A great example of how this can come up that people don't think about is where, let's say someone, a big donor has given you some money, fingers crossed, uh, except they have some reputational stuff that comes up. You find out they've done something that's a no-no and you as an organization don't wanna be aligned with them anymore. What does it look like to give that money back? We actually, in some states, um, giving that money back would be a violation. It would be private annealment. And the reason would be, once the donation is made, they lose custody is what it's called. So they no longer have say over how that money is allocated. That money is charity money. So you're take, technically taking charity money and giving it to an individual. So do you have a process in place to where if you receive a donation that you kind of wish you didn't receive, what is the process for undoing that? Do you give it to another organization? That's usually how you see people handle it. So if there's a harassment issue that's come up, they may donate it to an organization that's, that's um, whose mission it is to do storytelling for women and give resources and, and address harassment in various places. And so, you know, making sure you have a process for that. Um, thinking about things like fringe benefits with the uh, compensation. You've probably seen a lot of organizations end up on front page papers and newsletters and websites because of a car that they gave their executive director or just something that was a little bit much. Uh, there should be some type of process that you follow for determining compensation that you look at the comparables for other organizations of a similar size doing similar work in similar areas and determine what your compensation, including French benefits, looks like off of that uh, because if what you are giving to your executive director, and some of you may be saying, well, I don't, I know for a fact, I don't have to worry about that. But for those of you that do, if what you give is too much, if it doesn't make sense, so, and, and by too much, it could also just be if they're working part-time hours, but you're giving them a uh, compensation that is not commensurate with part-time, but with full-time. Not only will the organization possibly be responsible for excess benefit penalties if it's a 501c3, but the board and whoever received the benefits can be responsible for personal liability that they have to pay back as part of the excess benefit, again, in the US. So you wanna make sure that you're monitoring that, that you have processes in place, that you're thinking about private annealment. Anytime you're lending assets, if it's a town home that you rent out to families and a board member wants to use it one day, don't let them use it. That might be, that would probably be private annealment. If, you know, um, 
people usually pay their executive directors in your area $75,000 and you uh, lease, you know, a Maserati for your executive director, probably going to be problematic. And so thinking about these things is going to be really, really important. Um, but of course, don't swing toward distraction. This is not to say don't pay people. This is to say, um, just make sure that you have processes in place for what that ends up that ends up looking like. And to that point, you know, have your process in place for paying vendors. They at the IRS, if you're a 501c3, says it has to be arm's length. So how are you making sure that you're paying the market rate? No more, possibly less, but no more than market rate. How are you making sure that they're delivering on what they say they're going to deliver on? How are you making sure that the quality is up to par? All these things have to be thought about. If your board is small, then it's especially important that you have some type of committees ad hoc or standing that you bring together to maybe vote on these contracts. Because if you have a board of four, one of the board members says, hey, I have a cleaning service. Let me clean up the offices. And the other three board members vote on it. That could be problematic So, um, because they're, they're considered interested. So have a process for that. Have a process for executive director compensation. Be vigilant in documenting, researching, and documenting what was the thought process behind paying what we paid. Document everything you looked at, everyone you spoke to, because if a question comes up, if the AG comes knocking and says, and when I say that, attorney general comes knocking and says, hey, we've gotten a complaint about you and paying your executive director. How did you make this decision? You want to be able to say, we talked to so-and-so. We looked at the board source comps. Every year they put out comps. They're not cheap, but they do put out comps. Um, and that's how we decided on this. Uh, but make sure that you make sure you have that in place. Um, let me look through comments before I keep going. Yeah, if you're 501c4, many of them are going to be very similar. And if anything, because 501c4s are not as regulated as 501c3s, you've probably seen them coming up in the news a lot recently here in the US. And so making doubly sure that you have things documented is going to be really important. Uh, in terms of resources, Almost every city has a one-stop business office. Usually they'll have a nonprofit arm or somebody that has nonprofit expertise. So if you're overwhelmed, you're thinking, I don't know what to do. How do I even start? See if you have a one-stop business office. I know here in Houston, we actually do. Uh, so see if you have that. Talk to them. The IRS, for all their challenges, have a phenomenal website. So if you go to their stayexempt.gov site, they've got cartoons. Uh, they've got videos. They've got... Um, a lot of technical assistance guys. They've got life cycle resources. There's a ton of resources on their website. So if you haven't signed up, sign up for that. And they usually do a really good job with their newsletter. So join their newsletter uh, because they'll send out when there was change in the taxing of fringe benefits. They sent that out immediately and got comment. And so make sure that you um, follow that. And then attorney general office, whoever monitors organizations, follow their website reach out to them. They're usually very friendly, believe it or not. Um, and so if you say, hey, I just want to make sure that I'm keeping up with my compliance requirements, what would those be? They're usually pretty good at that. And then follow blogs. I'm a big blog person. Lex blog is great. I have a blog for nonprofits where I try to blog. It's been a little bit of time, but uh, Tax Girl has a blog where she talks about tax issues for nonprofits. So uh, keep up with those. So I just saw Overwhelmed. Addressing the overwhelm, it is okay. Everyone is dealing with this. I am telling you these things because really it needs to be something that you're thinking about and do your best to plan around. So if you know, for example, e-commerce is your jam and you're really trying to bump that up, maybe that's what you prioritize as an organization is e-commerce. Reach out to others that have e-commerce sites. Reach out to your local um, comptroller is usually who's going to be responsible, your tax entity. Uh, see what they say around it. There is a way. All of this is merely to say these are things you need to be thinking about. Um, your risk for each could be different. If you are a three-person organization that intermittently emails people in Germany, maybe privacy law is a concern, but it's not the hugest concern that you have. So. Uh, be thinking about that. Be strategic, you know, in terms of what your biggest exposures are and then work from that place. If we're really trying to bump up fundraising and we're reaching out and putting our hands into everything, then maybe focusing on the fundraising piece is going to be the most important for you. Um, engage with expertise creatively. So like I said, there is a place for the rockets and the zooms. It's not to say don't use them. It's to say if you are needing someone to handhold or say, 
this is what you need to be thinking about. That's not what that's for. <laughs> you know, that's really to say, hey, we've done this. We've started 18 businesses. We just need somebody to do paperwork because we haven't done it. Right. And so if you have questions, if you want to think strategically, reach out to legal clinics at the law schools. Usually there are legal clinics or there are clinics that work with law students at a reduced or free amount um, that you can reach out to. I know U of H here. I've worked with them. Uh, in Houston have a legal clinic that many of my clients who just weren't in that space to have the budget have reached out to and found great help. There's other, there's associations in Houston and in Texas, we have the Texas Accountants and Lawyers for the Arts. So you might see if there's a similar entity in where you are. Uh, there is an entity that has corporate counsel for large corporations that do pro bono work for nonprofits. You might reach out to them. I know that oftentimes I will have people hire me for just an hour and they can pummel me with questions. What should I do here? How should I be thinking about this? I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what I should be thinking about. What should I be thinking about? Maybe you just schedule an hour with a local attorney and ask them a ton of questions. And they may not be able to help you from a budget perspective, putting in place all the templates or putting in place all the um, compliance items, but they may be able to give you some advice on what that looks like. And then you just maintain the relationship with them. Um, and then crowdsource resources. I've worked with clients, it's groups. So I've had multiple nonprofits come together and say, hey, we all have this thing that we're thinking about. Can you talk to us? And then they split the cost for that. Um, I've done project split for people like that before. And so there may be others in the area around you that have similar questions that just say, you know what, we wanna do a board training and just understand what our board obligations are for the year. Let's get three or four together and then we'll just split the costs of having people come in and educate on that. So don't, again, feel like you have to, to do this on your, your own. I know that was a lot. And again, it may, some of you may have known all this and be on it. And so if there are, are questions that you have that I can address uh, that weren't covered, I'm happy to try to do, especially our international Brothers and sisters, uh, I didn't want to speak too much on it because there's just so much change that's going on internationally, but I'm happy to try to answer any questions that I can. Okay, thank you so much, Erin. That was a lot of really useful information, and I really appreciate you addressing the overwhelm. All, you are not alone in this. There is a community to support you. There are resources to support you, and again, this is a lot of information to process. We will be sharing this slide deck and we will be sharing the recording and any of those useful links to go along with it. Now, before we jump into q and I see we just lost Erin, so I'm hoping that she'll hop back on. I have a quick announcement to make. Uh, we have launched a community called the Donor Box Knowledge Community, and this is an amazing place where nonprofit pro professionals can connect with like-minded individuals and ask questions and get focused answers to those questions regarding web development, fundraising, board management, volunteer management, compliance, and so much more. So before we go into q and I'm going to launch a quick poll, and I'm going to share that now. Are you a member of the DonorBox Knowledge Community? Again, this is an amazing place for you to find these like-minded individuals and connect with these nonprofit professionals. There's a group of community managers there to answer your questions and wonderful experts like Erin that can jump in and hop, you, uh, hop, hop on and answer those questions for you. And I see we've got um, a lot of folks who, are, who have not joined. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch the link, please. Join our donor box knowledge community and you'll see that in the bottom right hand corner of your screen um, to get connected and uh, have that support that you really, really deserve. Now we have so many questions, Erin. There was so much engagement. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're gonna do our best to answer as many as we can. Again, if we cannot get to your question today, please join the donor box knowledge community ask your questions and we will get to them. Perfect. So our, oh, there we go. I was gonna say, uh, and th the ancestors were with me because it clicked off right as I finished the presentation, thankfully. So hopefully we'll, we can yes. make it to the end. Um, so Judith, Board Source is the one that does board compensation comps. They're one of the, they're not the only one, there are a few others, but they're, oh, theirs is well known. And so um, usually people use theirs because you can't go wrong with it. Um, 
Sounds a lot more complicated from Eve than I thought. Is there a cost-effective way to hire an agency to take care of the compliance? There is. Now, cost-effective, that's definitional. Uh, what I would say is, again, think about what your highest risk is. So there are people, for example, that just do fundraising and maybe you hire someone to come in, kind of like a bookkeeper every quarter just to make sure that you're OK with your fundraising. Or if it's I just want to make sure that my foundational stuff is OK. I've had a lot of clients hire me just to do an audit of their. Oh, OK, there it goes. Uh, an audit of their foundational documents. And so um, maybe that maybe that's the way to go. Maybe I'll stop clicking because it's, it's slowing this down. Best way to research international laws from Eve. Uh, the blog that I mentioned, Lex blog is another one. Um, what is it? And I'll share, I'm gonna be part of the donor box community. I'll share a couple of blogs that I follow that talk internationally specifically about nonprofits in, in, in the donor box. Um, someone asked about 1099s. You may have spoke on it, but what about Law Depot and such for temporary 1099 contracts? So the templates and things can be helpful. What I would say is use templates to inspire. So I tell clients, give me your templates that you think cover the things that are really important to you. And then what we'll do is we'll build off of it. It helps with costs because then I'm not having to start from scratch with them. But I've had clients come to me that were in Texas that had New Zealand law in their contracts because they didn't pay attention. And it created some problems, as you can imagine. The problem with using templates verbatim is that you don't know what rationale or reasoning went into the language that they used. And there's a lot of words of art. There's a lot of strategic reasons. You say something that you don't say something, that you include something, that you don't include something. Um, all It's an art to it, to be completely honest. And so the template is helpful because it can get you thinking about what you need to be thinking about. But talk to someone to see is something else that isn't included that I need to be including into my contracts as, as well. So the answer is, yes, it can be helpful to start. What you might do is work with someone to put together templates for your 1099s is what I, I do. And so I just put together a template and then there's addendums that I attach. So if someone tells me they might be hiring a marketer, we'll have a marketer addendum. If they might be happy hiring a copywriter, we'll have a copywriter addendum. And so get your baseline document, again, cheaper and cost effective, and then just have a bunch of addendums that you attach to customize it. Um, are the recommended legal and accounting resources for nonprofits contracting with businesses for services? I'm going to put some links in there. How do you get grants if your nonprofit is a 501c3 and the company only offers a service? I've been researching info and it seems with grants it's very confusing. So this was from Marie Hamilton and I don't know if she's still on. Um, if your nonprofit is and the company only offers a service. So I have service organizations that I've worked with that offer that get grants. I, I'm not entirely sure and you might put into the chat. Uh, what your specific concern was. What I would say is um, relationships tends to be what gets most of my clients who do a service, the, the grants is that they have relationships both with the community, but with funders. So that may be a big thing. And, and funders tend to give to who they know. So if you don't have a relationship with them and you're not on their radar, they're not going to give to you. And, and a someone who has relationships, so someone, a part of Association for Fundraising Professionals or similar, uh, may have those relationships with the funders and can introduce you. There's a, a wonderful woman I've worked with here that knows every funder under the moon. And so when I have an organization that I'm really wanting to get on people's radar, I just introduce them to her and she's able to talk them up to other people. So that might that might be one way. How important is the Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, and to piggyback off of that, Erin, um, if you visit our nonprofit blog, so the DonorBox nonprofit blog, if you oh, yes. go into the search bar, type in grants, there are going to be a whole slew of wonderful articles that you can look at, especially if you're a, a new nonprofit. And we also have how to start a nonprofit guides, and it will walk you through those steps after you've become incorporated, what you can do to get that funding. So um, I'm going to go ahead and drop the link in the Please chat so do. that you can check out our blog. There, that is definitely an art. And what I would say is it's very location specific. So once you get those amazing resources, get connected to somebody who knows your local ecosystem that can translate that stuff for you because there may be some cultural nuances. I know in, in Houston, there's a lot of nuances around stuff like that. Um, Judith asked, how important is DO, D and O insurance, directors and officers for those of us? Uh, any suggestions where to get it at the best coverage price? I've heard Travelers is really good. Um, so you might try travelers. DNO is important. And here's the reason why. 
if someone files a claim against the organization, the board directors are going to be responsible for paying it. Well, really, the organization is going to be responsible for paying for that um, if it has the money. And a lot of organizations don't have the margin or bandwidth to be able to pay for the retainer of an attorney um, to do the court costs that come associated with that. If there's some expert witnesses and things like that, it can get expensive very quickly. So what the insurance does is it gives you that, that margin and that cushion to be able to, even if it's getting rid of the lawsuit, which is usually what it is, to just get rid of the lawsuit, you have the margins and the ability to, to, do, to do that. It's not the cheapest. Uh, what you may do is you may work with someone who has different riders to give you different coverage. And so some people just give you a straight package and that's why it can be so expensive. I want to say Travelers uh, Prudential, maybe another one that came up. Um, they tend to have very specific riders. And so if you work with kids, you can get that. If you do, you know, uh, busing or anything like that, you can do that. So you may look at your insurance providers uh, in the area to see who would allow you to do an a la carte. And that tends to make it a little bit more uh, affordable, but definitely having directors and officers is important. The number one lawsuit organizations, nonprofits tend to have is employment, which surprises me every time, but overwhelmingly it's employment lawsuits. Um, and those can get very expensive just in terms of the discovery and bringing someone on to answer questions and make sure that you don't say something wrong. So you'll wanna make sure that you have some type of insurance to be able to cover you in that situation. Um, can a link on a website with contact information meet the public accessibility requirement uh, for documents from Ruth? Yes, it absolutely can. Mm, let me copy out that. It depends, <laughs> I forgot. Depending on your jurisdiction in the US, typically, yes, that is enough in terms of public accessibility. Now, if it's you know a hyperlink in the tiny bit in the corner that's camouflaging into your footer that no one can see, no. So it's got to be, you know, pretty visible. It's got to be something that people, I tell people, put it in your menu, to be honest, because uh, you just don't want to chance it with something like that. But that, that can technically be enough for you. Can all books and records be digital? No, in many instances. Um, you need to print them out because what needs to happen is the law, the way it's written. And again, remember how long ago these laws are written. I need to be able to go to your place of business and say, give me your books and records and you hand them to me. If they're digital, that probably isn't going to happen like that. Now, you can charge for copies and things like that, but you will want to have a binder where you've printed out your books and records and you have that accessible for viewing. Um, I also just, you know, it gets tricky. Now, you can have them digital in addition to having them printed, but you'll definitely want to have at least your yearly, you know, if I, I get maybe if you don't want to keep a ton of records and paper, I also hate having to, to kill trees. Um, but, you know, to a certain extent, you want to make sure that you have that stuff printed out. What are your Aaron, thoughts? I think we've, oh, Go ahead. I think we've one got time for one more. I and saw all that. do not panic. Again, we have so many wonderful questions here, and we will reshare the link for the Darner Box Knowledge Community so that you can ask your questions there. Okay, one more, Erin. Take it away. I know. I was, I was in the zone. Um, what are your thoughts on using a fiscal donor in the interim of waiting to be approved? Absolutely. Uh, and really what I would say is experiment with a fiscal donor. I tell my clients, start with a fiscal donor before you even start a nonprofit. That may not be helpful for some of you, uh, but if you're starting something new, because that allows you to, to kind of put your feet in the water and see if you even like it before you go through the process of actually doing your 501c3. But if you are in that process, a fiscal donor is great. Make sure you have a fiscal sponsor agreement. Make sure you're clear on when you receive your funds, what you have to submit to receive your funds, um, what kind of rights they have to audit your documents. I mean, there's nuances in terms of your um, documentation for that. The National Network of Fiscal Sponsors is a great resource uh, in terms of seeing what some of those agreements might end up looking like. All right. Wonderful. Woo. We covered <laughs> a lot, y'all. There was a, a lot of information here. To remind you, we will be sharing the recording, the slide deck, and we'll include some really great links to resources that Erin has mentioned. Uh, and we will be sharing that in our Donor Box Knowledge Community. Please click the link to join there. We'll also be sending an email to all of the registrants. Erin, I want to thank you for this very eye-opening session. This is such an important topic and we had so much engagement here. We really appreciate your expertise on this. And all, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for 
all that you do to help your community and beyond. We are here with you during this journey and we are here to support you in any way that we can. And we are so proud to provide the tools and resources you need to help you help others. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in the community. Thanks, Erin. Thanks.